Hello! Hi everybody! It's me, Jennifer from Little Metal Foxes, and I am going to be joined by Michelle from Lear Works that does the most beautiful uh, filigree this evening, and we're going to talk about some of our favorite uh, filigree tools. So, hi Karen, how are you? Ah, there she is now. Let's see if we can get, uh, let's see if we can get Michelle. Hi. All right. Here she comes. So, hey there. How are Hello. You? Hopefully Hi. the sound is okay. I have misplaced my headphones. Oh, yeah. No, you're fine. You're and fine. so, <laughs> um, and I have I my hate heater that. going because I came in here and it was like 55 degrees. So. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. no. You sound fine. I can hear you okay. fine. So, um, welcome to, yes. uh, to Little Bubble Thanks Foxes. for having me. Tool Talk. I'm so excited. My um, favorite subject. On... Oh, yeah, indeed. I, we were going to do this on Tuesday, but as you know, um, we were heading back from our Little Metal Foxes retreat, and there was some snow up on uh, Whidbey Island, so we got a little bit delayed. But, um, but yeah, so we decided to do it this evening. So thank you for that. Thank you for postponing. Um, I ended up hanging out with Chris. On... Did you? Yeah, I thought I saw that. Yeah from uh, uh, Lion Punch Forge. Yes, um, thank Chris, you. Chris is amazing, yes. So um, hopefully we'll see Chris hanging out tonight this, as well. Um, shout out to Lion Punch Forge. Oh, we love you. So yeah. Um, also, I am thrilled to say that you're gonna be teaching filigree awesome. with Little Metal Foxes. <laughs> and the class awesome. is currently sold out. Yes. Um, and uh, so keep your eyes Hello, open Chris. if you're out there. He's here. Hi, Chris. Oh, hey. We were just just speaking your name. There you go. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to uh, to welcome you to Little Metal Foxes Thank you. for teaching as well. We're very excited about that. So I'll be um, sort of TA, and Chris is going to be there as well. So we're really excited to yes. have a fun crew on board for all of the um, uh, all of the fun that that's going to be. And it's uh, a two week class. Yes. So, that'll be fun. so two right. sessions with a week in between. My right. hope is that people will want to w actually work on a project, not just watch. <laughs> right. And right. that way be like, I'm, I know this sounds crazy, but I hope that people will have problems because if yeah. they have, if they, if they're actually doing it and they're encountering problems, then we can actually solve them. Right. And if they're, if they're I, not having problems while we're totally agree. learning, then later down the road, they're going to run into them and be like, I don't know. <laughs> so right. I'm hoping that people will be able to encounter some things that we can fix. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's always good when that happens because you learn from your mistakes, you know, and being able to sort yeah. of see what happens when, you know, you make mistakes, you know, during a live demo or, and I, a lot of times will keep some of mine just so that I can show examples of, you know, it goes wrong. Things, yeah. things go wrong. You melt things or, you know, um, so, but yeah, learning from, learning from experience and mistakes is always kind of a good way to go. So, yeah. So we're very excited about that. Um, but I wanted to chat with you a little bit about some of your favorite tools. Cause I pulled out some of mine so many. for, I know <laughs> it's I hard to narrow it down. Them. I'm like, Hmm. Mm. So I've got a few that are kind of like my, in my like secret arsenal of, of things that I really like. Um, first and foremost, you know, it's like every pair of tweezers that's ever existed. Oh my you know, word. I love, Do you know how yeah. many pairs of tweezers I ordered to find the perfect pair? <laughs> God, I, this is just the new ones. <laughs> <laughs> this is my current favorite. It's the, um, it? it's the double, it's the double zero, but it's the ones by Venus. Oh really? Have you used the Venus ones? They're the I've got <laughs> they're the, the twenty dollar ones. Blue, I've got the blue heron ones right These here. These ones have a little bit finer tip. So what yeah, I didn't these know. These are just. Yes, I do like those. Those are a great yeah. one for like I I bought both of them. So what I didn't yeah. know before getting tweezers was mm -hmm. like a double zero in this brand might be totally different from a double zero in another brand. So True. like yeah, this they one has bit. like nice, thick, strong sides, which is what I need because I use it a lot for shaping. But right. that exact same one in a different brand or a cheaper brand is 
totally different. Yeah, it can be a little bit different. So I, I just like I, ordered, I ordered all the, all the tweezers. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I like having, I like having like good cheap pairs for soldering. It's always nice to have a few pairs for stuff like that. Um, but yeah, when I'm, when I'm doing some forming with them, those double zeros, man, from yeah. like Blue Heron or a good quality pair, they, they cost a little bit more, but yeah. they're worth it. Cause they're, it's like the world's tiniest pliers. You know, right. they're just, they're well, great for shaping and bending. Well, I use the back. And... I use the back right. a lot. I use it, right. I actually use it for pushing sometimes. I use it for, mm -hmm. for flattening. Um, sometimes I push, I push this way, like vertically. Right. And then sometimes I'm squeezing with this inside part. So basically it's... they need to be like fine, a little bit of a fine tip, but they need yeah. some strength. Like that's the point. Like if you're looking, you're like, what what tweezers do I use? You want there to be like a little muscle right here. Otherwise, yeah. you're not gonna have enough to be able to push. And I use a little thicker and a little sturdier material than you use. So even I, more, yeah. I need I need to be able to like really use these and know that I'm not gonna destroy them. Right. And crush your stuff. Those are sensitive enough you can like really lay things down and give it a little pressure without yes. feeling like you're like you know crushing it completely the um yeah a lot of my stuff i'm usually using uh fine silver for most of my fill but i've also i also work in uh copper when i'm like teaching mm -hmm. people originally because it's like let's work in copper it's not precious they can learn how to twist they can mm -hmm. learn how to that. so so sometimes if i've got a longer class i actually start with copper and then we'll do a, um, a little copper plating, you know, a little pickle plating. So it ends yes. up being, you know, this nice little, you know, just for practice and shape. And, and the copper. If people cool don't know what pickle plating is, it's when you're, you're using silver solder on copper and then you don't want that to stay a silver color. So you use your spent pickle that you've saved, you know, when it gets super blue, you use your mm -hmm. spent pickle and you do like the reverse action. And you can actually plate the silver solder so the entire thing looks like copper. So it all matches. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So then I will usually patina that with uh, liver of silver. So it's nice and black, you know? Yes. But, uh, and that yeah. would be a great, so I mean, if you, if you aren't able to um, copper plate, you could just blacken all your silver and it would be just... Oh, <laughs> oh absolutely. You know, all the silver the solder, just turn it black. <laughs> Well, the silver silver, a lot of times the silver solder will stay like silver against the copper. And, I, and that's cool. why I always pickle. Mm -hmm. I always pickle plate it first. Oh, yeah. The gold plating pen, Chris says. Mm, that's good. I think that's, yeah. I think that's Chris's new favorite tool. Is it? That's his new favorite. <laughs> I'm, He's just playing love, with the love, plating pen. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Well, so tweezers, love them, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're awesome. But I have a pair of tweezers that are one of my favorites. And they're these, they're brass. So guess why? Do you love them? You got, you got a pair of those? I don't even know what I, I don't use them for anything. They're too flimsy. Here's what you use them for. What do I Here's use them for? what you use them for, Michelle. The pickle. Okay, why would I use these in the pickle? So when you drop tiny things in the pickle accidentally, or, you know, they, they fall in, you can actually put the brass tweezers in and pick up tiny pick pieces out. out of the pickle. Yeah. So I found that these are like, when I like drop something in there, I'm like, oh crap. You know, and the big, the big tweezers are the big, you know, tongs. Yeah. You're like, big. you're like fumbling yeah, you're around like, with your like, <laughs> like Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So these guys are so great because you can just reach in and take out tiny Now I know. I don't pieces. know what I did to mine, but they're bl blue on the end. <laughs> oh. I, I did yeah. something to them. Not sure. Yeah. Well, if you get them in the pickle. These are very, I would not <laughs> use these for filigree, though. These are very flimsy. No. Look how yeah, thin no, those walls are. These, yeah. Compared to these. these. Specifically, specifically for pickle in small yeah. stuff. Yeah. So these are not filigree friendly. I just ordered them because no. I thought they were interesting and I didn't know what I wanted to do. With well, them. and that's the thing. I'll use them to pull like small parts of filigree out of pickle. So if I have even like a small little pickle thing. Um, but I also use, um, and one of Julia's favorite tips for like filigree and for granulation is she'll use uh, little plastic tea strainers Hang on. that she can put in. Oh, yeah. I have this on my bench. What is this? It? It's yes. also a tea strainer, but it's just yeah. open and I cut the end right. off so I can close my pickle on top of it. 
Oh, that is hard. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Those and these really are well. just like a couple bucks on Amazon. Yes. Yeah. Hers, hers actually snaps closed. So when she'll put little pieces of filigree in there, she can just drop it in and it stays closed. But then so you can't, and... you can't leave it in your pickle and have it just open and then just drop things into your basket. True. True. Which is what I always True. do. So it's just right. whatever your right. preference is. It makes sense. Yeah. Oh, Using I have small a new one. like that are fantastic for stuff like that. So yeah, absolutely. What else? <gasps> yep. That's what I do is I use it all the time. I Love replaced. Them. I replaced it with copper that had a, like a steel handle. This is for the um, Sonic ultrasonic cleaner, and oh. it's and it's vinyl. It's not metal. Right. Um, I clipped a couple of the hooks off, so I just didn't want them. And I just put this in my pickle pot. Oh, they're yeah. kind of expensive. I use filters. They're I just probably use cheap coffee filters. If I could find like a vinyl coffee filter, I know you can use stainless steel. Well, they the, a lot of the ones that you can pick up just at the grocery store are two dollars. They are plastic and vinyl. They are you know just yeah. I use them in the pickle yes. all the time. Yeah. So anything that it has that like mesh, that really fine mesh um, kind of mm -hmm. vinyl will work in your pickle. Yep, I love it. I love it. Well, a um, couple of other things. Rip things. Um, I love these little things because you can get them at like, uh, oh gosh, Michael Crafts and Joanne Fabrics are these guys. Yes. Are just tiny mandrels. Do you have tiny mandrels? I love tiny mandrels for farming <laughs> stuff. These are really cheap yeah, too. These are super yeah, inexpensive. They are. They're totally worth getting. I I... Yeah. If you want something like this. Yeah. I think you're right. I thought about putting it on the supply list for my filigree class, but you don't really need them. You know, you no. can use a wooden dowel or Absolutely. a Sharpie or, <laughs> you know, so I didn't put them on the filigree list. Knitting needles. Knitting needles. So but great. Look, I cut the ends off. I cut the ends off of mine. So they're like short. That's fantastic. <laughs> I have a, for really small jump rings, I don't use it for filigree, but for my really tiny jump rings, I use a needle for it's like an upholstery needle for um what's the word when it has like the pillows it'll come to me in a random or, it's like a very long needle like oh, this yeah, long yeah. and i stick it in yeah. my pepe ring my um my jump ring maker and it's like a little over a millimeter wide oh right yeah i use if i'm making tiny ones i'll use uh the back size of a drill bit yeah I think I needed mm -hmm. one that, that was just really well a too. smidge tinier than the yeah. back end of yeah. a drill bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. So I really like those. Oh, well, the back the handle of a, of a needle. I mean, it's sometimes oh, a yeah. needle file. Sometimes they're a little textured, but that's a great size. Yeah. Well, the um, Recently, I found on, um, oh gosh, uh, is it Monson Jeweler? That's yes, bezel farming pliers. These or guys. ones like this? Is that what you're talking about? I'm talking about the some bezels. of the comments. Oh, yeah. Those are so cool. The mini yeah. bezels. I love these things. Um, Good I just for so many just things. got them. Oh, my God. I am so excited about using those. They these are, are definitely fantastic. not necessary. It's a whole set. Yeah. Someone was just mentioning these pliers for... <laughs> these guys. I love these guys for forming. Um, so these are the nylon jaw pliers. I and never like use bracelet. mine. Not ever. I'll show you. Oh, let me show you. This is ring size, right? And that is bracelet size. So the thing about the bracelet size one is really great for doming. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's great if you're forming, you know, like bracelet It's good with, when you have filigree. And so for people watching, when you have filigree, you want to have, if you're shaping it, forming it, you want to have something underneath and something on top. Um, yep. so you don't want to like just form it because there's going to be like parts of the filigree that aren't going to want to, they're not going to want to like, go with everyone else. Right. So they need right. a little bit more. Well, so, so like to get like a dome on a piece like this, mm -hmm. um, and this is a, a piece, this is a trick that Victoria Lansford was teaching me, I use um, these. using, using these pliers to get that dome to shape because mm -hmm. you can kind of work them around in a circle 
and get that dome. So just using the bracelet forming pliers, these work really well to kind of get it just moving your way around to kind of punch it up in the middle. Um, I've also used when I'm I love those. Surgery. I okay. love yeah. all my wooden. You want to see my wooden yeah. block collection? Here, I will show sure. you. Sure. <laughs> show me. <laughs> let me turn you around. Show okay. me. We should probably oh, let people one. know that these are these tools are not necessary for filigree, but boy, they sure are fun. So I collect oh, yeah. almost every wooden thing you can possibly look at you. I oh, know. Swage blocks, oval this blocks. This one's actually really mandrels. inexpensive, right here. Yeah. Yeah, I've um, seen that one. That's a lovely Lots one. of nice shapes. I find that the wooden ones don't go small enough or they're not deep enough. Like, look how shallow those right. are compared to, like, this one. Right. Look how deep right. that one is. So if I'm right. actually making, like, a bead or something, half the time I just take one of these and I stick mm -hmm. it, I stick it in my vise, and then I use my right. – if it's really, really – um fragile and then i use this to form it around so oh, right. sometimes no, i do cool. that if i'm if i'm like you know having to like babysit it but yeah right look at yeah. all these wooden well, shapes oh my gosh i know so I, many. That. So I know it cool. makes me so oh happy i just stand in front of my <laughs> my tools and i just look at them oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> my husband comes in and he's like you have an anvil and you have a machinist device, and can I use it? No. <laughs> Get out. No. <laughs> yeah, so th this is one of the ones I like for getting the, the filigree started, is this one, which is the ring size one. But mm -hmm. that one is really kind of great because it just, you can kind of form it around yes. and get them kind of overlapped. Things that are final are wonderful. Both sides. They're yeah, they are. wonderful yeah, they are. for, for I, I use these a lot. Um, actually, yeah. one of my very first instructors, I've never taken a filigree class. I've done most of it on my own, um, but I've taken mm. like soldering classes. And my first instructor, she was like, oh, I brought in all my little box of tools. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Can you look through my tools? And, <laughs> and she looked at me and she's like, ah, dumb. You'll never use those. Ah, you'll never. And then. <laughs> Because she never uses them. Right, and then, right. And then I was like, wait, I use these all the time. I yeah, just hadn't right. remembered. Well, and and I, I like, one of the, the tricks that I like to do is if you've got a pair of parallel mm, pliers like that. That's on um, my list. You can get, that's you can on get my those list. with nylon jaws. But it's not on my that, filigree list as far as, like, you don't have to have them. But, oh, my goodness, they yeah. make life easier. Oh, yeah. Well, and these, I actually just used a little bit of suede yes. and um, a little rubber cement or double, actually it was double-sided tape and put the double-sided tape in and the suede and just gave it a squeeze. And so these are really soft jaws now. So they're firm, yes. but they're soft and they're not going to And you can vinyl. get vinyl ones for that. Yes. Um, yes. I actually really like these as a mandrel as well. Yeah. Because, yeah, right? um, because this is so thick. And because it's parallel, you can actually use this to create your shapes. And you, you, mm -hmm. just, you just use this as your measuring tool. So if yeah. you're making it's like, like a, a square, yeah. okay, get, hold on. Yeah, use it like a bending break. You know, hold it and then flatten it against the edge. Okay, yeah, so yeah. you just use this part as a way to create your shape. And when you right. design something, you can design something around the fact that that, that exact dimension, you're going to get it every single time. This right. is called a parallel so, plier. Yeah, And you can exactly get them, right. oh, I don't know, they can, they, you can get them for like $16, $15. It yeah. kind of depends on if you want the really nice one. This is just one of the cheap ones. Yeah, they're not very expensive. I mean, you can, yeah, you can get, you know, they sort of vary a little bit. I but, have two. Um, the nice thing about two. the parallel the jaws with the nylon is that you can change them if they get marred. That and is on my are... next wish list. That is on my list cons... for my next order, actually. A lot of people don't realize that the nylon jaws are consumables. And yes. so you will at some point probably have to replace them. Mm -hmm. And they're not expensive to replace. And it usually comes with new little attachments and everything. So yeah. in case they fell out. You've and got if you, if in. you don't want to buy two things and you just want to buy one thing, 
buying this one is great. Um, also, there is one that's slightly tapered, so you can still use this back area as mm -hmm. the thicker part, and then you still have like a, a front part that helps. Right. Also, right. people don't quite realize that it goes pretty far back. So you can, yeah. I'll, sometimes when I'm doing pendants, I might even have one. I'll like right. stick it all the way down the throat. You know? Yeah. And then Well, this... and that's one of the nice things about the parallel jaw pliers that a lot of people don't realize is the throat is endless. So mm -hmm. if you've got a long piece of material that you need to, you know, flatten, you can, you know, it goes all the way back yeah. through the throat. So you can't do that with box joint pliers because, you know. I use them for pulling end. wire as well. I don't have. Yeah, straight. I, I don't, I don't mill my own wire usually, but if I oh. am. If I do need to like pull wire down, um, when I say pull wire, I mean um, a draw plate and you use a draw plate, mm -hmm. you kind of taper the end and then you pull it through a smaller hole and it makes your wire smaller. Um, right. so, I like it for straightening like square wire too, because you can yes. like grab it, especially with the smooth jaws, you can you know, pull it along and really straighten it. The, the, if I, I think if I was going to get like one, one pair of brand new parallel mm -hmm. jaws, the brass ones are really nice. Oh, I do not the have the ones, brass ones. Yeah, the brass ones don't mar. Ooh, a I lot have of to stuff put that one on my that. list. Yeah, I like the I like the brass ones, but they're really great for like um, the softer jaw, like the nylon jaw, are great for straightening square wire. You do have to be for, careful; um, these will mar. Lengths. These will right. squish your filigree if you're not careful. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why I like that, that um, putting a little bit of double-sided tape and the suede in them, because you mm -hmm. can just slide that metal through and it just straightens it right out. It's I really love nice. that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, filigree is, is one of those things that is practiced, has been practiced for a very yeah. long time all over the world. And mm -hmm. there are so many really beautiful examples that reflect the culture of where it comes from and the working style of the people of wherever it is in the world. So you get these really wonderful examples from uh, places like Nepal's uh, filigree is very different than Mexico. That's very different than Portugal. It's very different than China. So you've got all of these different pieces from so many different areas that can inspire and influence your work, yeah. you know? Um, so one of the things that's kind of interesting between, let's say, oh, I've got a piece from Portugal. There we go. Like a Portugal piece. Mm -hmm. And these pieces, you know, have the frame and twisted wire and they do a lot of the looping and doming. Yes. And so it has some dimension to it. The, um, during the Colombian exchange, when people came over to, uh, those idiots came over from <laughs> Spain and Portugal. The to, conquistadores. Uh, yes, see. Yes. Uh, so when they came over, one of the things that happened is that they would basically bring these pieces and say, we want you to make this. Yes. And because, because before that, they, a lot of the Incas and the Mayas, they worked with a lot of sheep. They're, they had lots of gold. But right. they weren't, from what I've seen, they weren't using those same kinds of techniques. Right. So by um, in, invasion of information, mm -hmm. the, the metalsmiths had to sort of diagnose or, or deconstruct um, the, the pieces that they were looking at because they didn't know how. Which is basically done. what I've done. That's exactly so, what I've done. So a lot of the, the Mexican filigree, like this piece from, uh, it's from the 1950s, mm -hmm. 1940s, I think, um, traditionally, the Mexican filigree is done by spinning and threading rather than twisting. So right. the wire is not, is not twisted together at they all. They have like the little, it's, like the texturing thing that they mm -hmm. use. It's almost like, it's almost like a knife with like a trough cut out of the middle. Yeah. Yeah. And then they some run it along use... a piece of wire to create the texture. Yeah. It's fascinating. So some will use that. And something some I never want to use. Do. Uh, I've seen them do it with um, uh, like a draw plate or using a um, uh, nuts, like small nuts that have some weight yes. and like spin it. Like a and tap and die kind down. of set. Yes. Tap and die set, mm -hmm. yeah. So I've seen those, but they'll put that texture on and then flatten it. So the piece is not twisted wire at all. It's just serrated. So 
Oh, what yeah. I use most of the time, that's exactly what it is. And it's actually oh. fantastic yeah. to start with when you're learning because it's when you have something that's two separate pieces, it's going to conduct heat differently than if something is solid all the way through. And I love, sure. I love using, it's so much easier. In fact, I have some right here. I love using twisted textured wire and then I run it through my rolling mill. It's fantastic. Right. 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 So I'm usually, I mean, for my stuff, I'll either use, you know, just straight wire, you know, and, or yep. a, a flattened, a flattened around wire or, um, twisted, uh, fine silver wire for my fill. What, so, um, what gauge of solid wire, uh, when you're doing the non-twisted version, do you usually use for your inside filigree stuff? It's, it doesn't matter. What's your really. favorite I mean, gauge? This, this piece is huge. And I think it's all, uh, like 18 or 16 gauge. But it's just kind of free formed and it's not, I mean, it's, it's wire work, but it wouldn't be, it's not really right. considered traditional filigree, but I mean, you can do interior wire work with, you know, right. whatever gauge you want, you know, kind of make it your own. Um, some of the pieces that I've got somewhere, um, I've used uh cloisonne wire on the inside. Yes. I use well. that for my, yeah. my zigzag, a little zigzag mm -hmm. machine. Oh, your zigzags. <gasps> zigzag machine. That's awesome. Is that how you do I have a whole printing? bunch, actually. I have this thing where I just, like, order everything I can find because I want to know. Yeah. I know it's just crazy. And then I usually, you know, end up selling it and passing it along. But, um, like, I got the toothpaste tube. Have you seen the, like, toothpaste mm -hmm. tube thing? But it's, like, yes. zigzag, and I want to know, could I do it? And I'm, like, right. I'm, like, a paper zigzagger. Could I do, could I use really the paper well. zigzagger to yeah. make a zigzag enough? out of fine silver, you know? So yes. I just have like, had a whole collection for a while, like different yeah. kinds. <laughs> I've seen people make them out of different gears as well. Yes. And just running them That's through the like- That's the traditional like... way. That is the traditional way. Right. And that was the hardest part for me um, as someone who's learning by myself in the cellar right. or in the, the cellar is where I started. Um, is and the deepest, darkest corners of your house underneath the. <laughs> okay, so as an introvert, little flickering bulb. I was like, well, yes. <laughs> uh, as an introvert, introvert, I was like, I'm just gonna hide down here. <laughs> no. I had like, I had three very small children. I probably had an infant at the time. I think he was like not even a year old, my youngest. And so I just, it was, I was hiding from everyone, and. Um, <laughs> But that was the yeah. hardest part was that, okay, I'm, I'm trying to learn this technique. I, I'm watching these videos on YouTube from like Mompox Columbia, which is this fantastic hub of filigree that's got multiple generations passed down. I'm watching these videos and I'm, and I'm trying to figure out what the tools are that they're using because every, every place that where filigree has evolved has evolved with tools. They've made them themselves. They've altered them. There's something that's available locally. Um, and so my biggest frustration half the time was like, what tool is that? And how do I make it? And how do I figure it out? And how do I do the zigzag? And I don't even know what it's called. So how do I even search that online? So a lot of the struggle for me was just, just tool related you know? Yeah. You know, I mean, and that's the thing. A lot of people don't, don't realize when they start doing jewelry, they think that it's there, there is, and there are catalogs now that you can kind of go and, and buy all the tools you want. But this is something, I mean, like casting alone has been done for mm -hmm. 6,000 years. Casting, and yep. They absolutely. didn't have a broken arts and peripheral caster and a, no. a vacuum machine that they were using to do that. And I'm the um, weird kid that would like read the Bible in the Old Testament because I liked all the macabre stories and, and wonder like, how the heck did they make a golden calf in the middle of the desert? I want to know. Someone tell me. <laughs> How <laughs> how did Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> make this enormous statue that's like right. you know solid gold? Right. Somehow they did and it. Which with which have been done for for you know thousands of years. I want to know hundreds, how it's done. Hundreds so and hundreds of years. That's why we're friends. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, I think it's, it's really kind of amazing when you start looking at stuff like that and realize like all the Egyptian cartouches, um, you know, they weren't sitting there like going, you know, oh, quick, get on the pony and ride over to Rio and grab some saw blades. They, mm-hmm. they, were, they had um, chisels and, and punches that they would use and actually stamp out the piercings and then like yeah. basically kind of like nibble it out with things like, um, uh, yeah, like punches and tools like that. So there were, um, you know, uh, you know, you didn't have access to the internet. Yeah, lots of catalogs didn't have new tools. It was the same tools from 50 years ago. And, you know, as uh, even 30 years ago, you didn't have access to like getting it overnight because there was no internet. So, right. you, you know, it's interesting how much information wise we've been able to gather in the last 20 years. I would not in the last be able years. to do what I'm doing. I would not be able to do what I'm doing without really without Instagram. I never would have figured it out. It wasn't until I started finding people that can kind of interpret things for me. Like, okay, so what, and I'd send them photos, the screenshots. What is this tool? And, and how, how do I figure this out? And what do I use? And (laughs) yeah, piecing it together. So, and that's the thing, you know, having to kind of, you know, work backwards in a way to like Mm -hmm. deconstruct the piece. So you kind of go, how did they do that? And, you know, so many tools again, were done with the materials around you that you would find locally. So if you had somebody who was a blacksmith, or you had somebody who was doing, you know, some, you know, steel work, a lot of times you could find somebody to make those tools for you um, and customize some things for you. But um, uh, there was, there's a book that I've got from like 1910. And it talks about making, it's like, okay, so go to your, um, you know, little, the the market or to your, you know, little mercantile and get a, a pack of needles and then break the eye off the needle and file it down so you can use it for a drill. And that was your drill. Um, yeah. So, you know, drill, drill, drill. Um, so you've got, um, you know, tools that have been, you know, customized and made. And, you know, if you don't have a wooden dapping block that's deep enough, well, you better start Make chiseling, one. You know, carve it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, you make one. You can even, um, you can carve most of it out. And if you have like the um, the metal set, the metal set is pretty right. easy to get because it's oh, yeah. sort of mass produced. In fact, that was another tool that my first instructor said, oh, don't buy that. Don't buy it. What? It's, it's <laughs> a waste of money. Don't use it. I, I love my first instructor, by the way. She was one of the last people that graduated from the Revere Academy. So I got like a whole download of Revere Academy. Um, but Oh on, my gosh, get, that's awesome. So you can get, oh. you know, the set with the metal punches oh, yeah. and you can right, take right. your wooden block and you can, you know, like I I have wooden blocks everywhere that have been like something that I've made. So you can take a wooden right. block like this and you can carve out the majority of your cavity and then take your hammer and, and the size you want and then, and then bang it the rest of the way. Like, right. so that you then create a smoother version. So you've removed right. most of the material and you're just using the punch to create a hollow that is more smooth and uniform. Right. So using things that, that you can heat up too, like a spoon, if you're trying to make a, a, a spoon shape, for example, you can kind of scrape out the shape, yes. get an old spoon, heat it up really hot, and burn the wood down and it smooths it out and makes it really shiny and slick. So that works. And really probably well. a little bit to harder it. too. Yeah, it does. Actually I wood. am terrible to my wooden tools. There's, there's like marks on them. Like I'm horrible to them. I, I'm pretty horrible well, to all thing, my tools actually. Like I use and, them but, so badly. <laughs> well, the thing is too, that you, those are great though, because you can file them and reshape them and yes. recycle them into or upcycle them into completely new tools. Right. Well, and then I just buy really good tools so that I can abuse them and they're still fine. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. I got this, this Lindstrom pair of needle nose pliers or or, um, round nose. They're so tiny at the end, but they've been going for probably 10 years and I am not. Very nice. I am not kind at all. I have found though, before you just go out and buy a bunch of Lindstrom pliers, this was my second pair of Lindstroms I got. And they must be like different versions because this one bent immediately. 
So I don't yeah. know what the point is. I don't know what's going on with those. I need to talk to them about that. Yeah. I've been switching everything oh to Tronics gosh. because they're my favorite brand. <laughs> they're really nice. Those they have really so nice. many different kinds of pliers. Okay, this is one of the things. I use this tool all the time. And when I go into other people's studios, I don't see this tool. And it's the round flat. Not the half yeah. round flat, but the round flat. Yeah. And I don't know if other people just don't use these, but I use them constantly. I do too. I use them a lot. Um, they're really great for making um, uh, like eye hooks and things on things. If you're doing like wire twisting, especially, it's great because you can like get that thing really tight and the square or the yeah. flat part will hold things a little bit differently. So mm -hmm. I like those, especially if I'm doing like uh, wire wrapping. They're great for that. Yeah. So I recommend having some of these in your studio, no matter what you're doing. Okay. Absolutely. Here's the number one favorite tool in my studio. I use this the most. Yeah. <laughs> and I would not be able to live without it. Like if I don't have okay. any, I'm in trouble. Ready for it? Okay. Yep. What is it? Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. I, yes, I have like, a, I have like six different tapes up there in front of me right now. <laughs> I would not be able to, but, do you know how many things I use this for? I use it for yes, holding I things do. on my anvil. When, no, not my fingers. This is, I actually do filigree straight on tape. And those of you that are in my class will learn how I do that. Um, and then I transfer the whole thing over to my soldering area. Um, I tape it on my bench block and actually found this kicking around. I'm going to totally do filigree on this. But um, yeah. I use filigree on tape. I also use the tape to cushion things. Mm -hmm. I use it sometimes to protect something from getting scratched. So like I've polished the back of something and I don't want it to get scratched. So I stick masking tape on the back and it mm -hmm. keeps it from, you know, getting all messed up on my bench pin. Like if I'm, if I have to polish it before I do prongs or something. I, use I can't it make jump rings without it. I mean, no. I, cause I wrap it around my jump rings and saw through. I it. tape, I use masking tape on my, on my anvil when I'm, when I'm stamping and I'll like tape things oh. down. Sometimes I'll stamp right straight through it oh, or smart. I'll put it under my stamping as a little bit of a cushion cause I'll, it'll go a yeah. little deeper. So I use it. Yeah. I use it all the time. Yeah. Masking tape. You know what? Some I, people are like, Oh, things... I never use it. And I'm like all the time. Every day. Oh my God. Yeah. No, I, I have. It's like, that, uh, if you looked at it's... my, at my drawer, I have like, I save all the masking tape I use because there's like filings on yeah. it. And so I save it all and then I yeah. turn oh, it all in. Look at this. Great. Yeah. At work, at, at my least, same lot. thing. Because one of the things that I'll do, I make, um, I'm usually we making like more. big earrings, right? <laughs> <laughs> just keeps going. <laughs> it just keeps going. So what, but what I do is I'll, you know, make a big coil for like, you know, hoop earrings and I need the gap to be consistent through all of them. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is actually, um, I have a, a, coil, a, a roll of tape like that that's measured and I have like um, 10 millimeters and uh, 15 millimeters. Uh, so it's like divided down the middle and I used uh, my um, dividers to mark it and then just cut through it with my X-Acto. So all I have to do is peel, peel off a 15 millimeter, lay it on my coil and mark and it. And you have those turkey. exact marks. Yeah. And I have the exact mark. Super yeah. useful. So super cheap. I use it for measuring. Yeah. I use it for um, measuring. With filigree, I burn it off. I trim it and I, I burn it off, which is messy. The upside is that I don't lose as many balls. The downside oh. is that it's messy and it, at sometimes the soot from the tape burning off can cause my solder to not flow. So I think of my first round of soldering as tacking it together. Like I'm just tacking it all together right. so it's not moving anywhere. And then I'll go back, pickle it, go back and do it again. Um, right. But I tried medical tape. Like I had like all these different kinds of tape. And I was like, all right, which one burns the cleanest? Which one doesn't leave a sticky residue? Which one, like when I fired up, which one's going to work? And it was this one. It won. Even that, like that, I thought that thin, you know, that thin medical tape, it's like paper. It's like oh. almost see-through. It's like white, yeah. almost see-through. I thought, this is right. paper. This feels like paper. This will, this will probably be better. No, it wasn't better. It was like far more sticky. Like it left a worse residue. 
This was much cleaner. You what about use a mask that who knows what, what fumes are coming off of it. <laughs> yeah. What about painter's tape, like the blue tape? Um, it's thicker. And it's really? far more plasticky. Oh, so okay. I would not burn that one off. I haven't specifically used that one, and I should probably conduct another experiment. But um, you can go ahead and try it. I mean, that's the whole point of learning how to do something is like, hey, figure out how you want to do it. You know, like, learn my method, and then you figure out how you want to do it. Um, but painter's tape, yeah, is a, this is really thin. Painter's tape is a lot thicker. It's also textured. It also, like, as far as I'm concerned, the least amount of material I can get away with will mean that, that I can burn it off easier. And, you know, I feel like the basic masking tape maybe has less chemicals in it. I could be wrong. I don't know. That could be. I mean, yeah. Don't know. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, Michelle, I have yes. to say thank you so much. I'm Wait, only, I have I'm one more. thrilled to see you. Oh, you do? Okay, what? This. <laughs> yep. Your this drill. is amazing. And you can get yep. them so cheap. This is how I make most of my filigree wire. I do not use my right. Dremel. I don't use my flex shaft. I use this. I put one end in a vise. I put the other end in here. I bend each end and put masking tape on it so that this grips something. And then I use this. And the cool thing about this is that I can feel the tension in the wire. Right. Whereas yeah. with the, the Dremel has so much power. It's just like, it's super easy to just destroy it. What is that thing? Is that the same it's thing, a, but just looks differently? Yes. Wow. Yeah, it's just got, it's got like a, this was from like a thrift store, store or an it's antique serious. store or. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like it's these, like some I sort mean, of these, ray gun. <laughs> these are just so useful. And yeah. what I like about these two is that it has a lot more torque than most of the other ones. Like if you're doing a really high gauge, like you're doing a 16 gauge, a 14 gauge, and you're trying to twist that, this is going to be a lot better. You're going to be able to have more power in your own hand than if you were using a motor. Um, so it's true. Well, and the nice thing is, you know, the, even the bigger ones, because you can get big versions of that, that the, the chucks open up really wide. So you can actually yes. get, yeah, like 16 gauge in there. And you can find easily. them. I mean, I, I've seen them online, but you can find them at an antique store. You can find them at a thrift store. Oh, yeah. Start looking at oh, the yeah. tool area and you'll find one of these like for 10 bucks or something. Or less. Yeah. You can usually find them pretty cheap. Okay, wait, I but... said one more, but I, I really have one. Just... <laughs> no, we can it. literally keep going for another hour. I know, okay. I know. I'm like, you, so... you don't know what I'm looking at in front of me. <laughs> My mother is an art teacher. Mm -hmm. I come from a long line of painters and I hate painting. I will only paint if I'm going to win a contest and it's only because I have trips from my mother. Okay. So I have craft people everywhere, craft supplies everywhere. My mom's house is like an art school in her garage. I'm dinking around and I'm fine. I find this linoleum block. So when one, my, one of my grandmothers was into carving, she would carve uh -huh. like linoleum. So this is old printmaking. And I'm like, For like that's interesting. That's like a, that's a cool material. So this is what I actually use to flatten my filigree. That's smart. I stick that's this, really smart. I stick my filigree on a, on an anvil or something, something heavy. Yeah. And then I put this on the top and I use a vinyl dead blow hammer and I just hit it. That's and really that's, smart. There's a lining of linoleum on the top. So like my point with this is that like, look around, like yeah. find things. This is, this is from like a, like a stamp carving, you know, printing yeah. area. There's things right, everywhere right. that you can find that you can use. And I use this yeah. constantly. You know, and, and that's the thing. It's like, it's hard to tell people when they're, you know, wanting to learn and it's like, mm -hmm. well, I need all the tools. And it's like, no, you don't. You don't need all the tools. I mean, people have been doing this for thousands of years without all the tools. And you right. can do it too. And you our know, tool list is just trying to give people got. a starting point. It's basically yeah. saying, hey, this is what I'm going to be using. Right. This is yeah. a starting point. I mean, like my first for... list of supplies for you was like, 
well, you can use this and this, and then there's also this, this, and this, and then there's this, 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 and this, other right, alternative right. things. <laughs> And I was like, never mind. I'm just yeah. going to put on there what I'm going to be using, and then we can figure it out from there. <laughs> right. Well, it's like for wax carving, people are like, what are all the tools that you need? And I'm like, well, if you have something like an X-Acto knife and maybe some sandpaper and a file, you're going to be fine. <laughs> I like, went to the dentist and was like, that? got any old stuff I can have? Yeah. He's like, yeah, got a whole box. Here. I always, I always love it when the dentists are like, I always love it when the dentist is like, um, oh, you do jewelry? I do jewelry as a hobby. And I'm like, really? I do dentistry as a hobby. <laughs> and they're like. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Like, yeah. So great. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well, Michelle, thank you so much. And um, I am yes. so excited about your filigree class coming up and um so yes and i know that we've got a lot I, of people who are very excited about it i so. hope and like in like i want i'm not going to guarantee that i'm going to do this but i would like to do a live like maybe with chris we've talked about it um and actually show you how to make filigree wire i'm not going to mill it which means i'm not pulling it drying it i'm just going to take ready-made wire and i'm going to twist it for you and i'm going to show show you how i do it um, and also granulation. So I like, I know that we're not going to be doing that in class. So um, I will probably be recording that maybe with Chris or with one of you that wants cool. to participate. And I'm well, just going to show you how to Julia... do it so that it's out there and you can refer to it. Right. And Julia actually has a, a granule making class coming up. Ooh. So it's just, it's going to be a workshop for, uh, learning how to make granules and sort them for granulation. Um, so that if you're wanting to do, um, add the granules to filigree or to mm -hmm. granulation uh, techniques, um, making them certain sizes and different you know, quantities. And she, she's really good at it. She's got some great tips. So I don't know if she does the one. washer thing, but when I saw that on the Metalsmith Society, that was, that changed my life. So I use a washer. You can search this on Metal Smith Society. If you go to their website, go to their tip search. Don't search granulation because you won't find it. It's under balls. Search balls. You'll find it. Look for the one with the washers. So, right. <laughs> so I have search balls. <laughs> I write down exactly what I used. Um, a lot of times I use scrap, but when I need a bunch of them that are all the same size, it's just too much work to try to like take all the little scraps. So right. I use wire yeah. and then I put a washer on my charcoal and then I, the washer makes it so that I can clip it at the same length every time. Right. So then I move my washer, clip it again. Sometimes, and I usually have like four or five wires in my hand. So like there's four or five of them getting clipped all at the same time till right. my whole charcoal block is full of these little piles of little clippings. Um, and then I just record which washer I used and what my gauge of wire was. And that way I know I can go back and do the same exact size. So you can totally find that as what I've been sending people for my filigree class, go to metal Smith society, search balls in their tip search, look for the one with washers and it's fantastic. Yeah. Or take the class. Yeah. It's, that is one of the, the better ones. Yeah. And like I said, you know, Julia has um, a whole bunch of tips like that in her uh, granulation part one class. And awesome. then the granulation part two is gonna be actually applying the mm -hmm. grain to the plate. So yeah, um, yeah that's, that's fun. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't put mine cool. on top of my filigree. I put mine in it and it yeah. helps it be stronger. Connect. Like it has the, yeah, it, it makes, connect. it's like, it's like if you have a corner like this and then you stick something, you know, in, in the seam and then you have a stronger connection. So right. in my class, we'll be doing that. Um, and I will be teaching another class. I don't have anything on the calendar right now. So just stay tuned. You can follow um, Little Metal Foxes. You can get on my email list. So we'll be sending out yeah. emails when there's something else available. That'd be great. Yeah, we look forward to that always. So, um, okay, great. Thank okay. you, Michelle. You're welcome. Have a great, have a great evening. And if I'm, anyone wants I'm to talk excited. about tools or, or books, or uh, gardening and growing vegetables, I'm always available in the DMs. Awesome. Well, and you know, there are, um, yeah, lots of fun classes coming up. We've got, um, oh gosh, etch in a bag and roller mill. I'm and, in one uh, of your classes. 
I'm in the production tonight? class. Oh, yeah. That's so I'm going to be place. hanging out with you every Wednesday night. And I bet there's still room in that class if anyone there wants to join seats. me. There are a few seats. It is, and I have to say, seriously, that is one of my favorite classes that I've taught in the last. I feel years. like that's kind of like your, that's it's, your specialty. It's my jam. Um, that and casting and weird stone settings. Yes. <laughs> so I'm in the class jam. because there are some, I would like to be able to produce some designs that are not as intense in far as far as how much work I'm doing I would like to be able to do just a little bit of filigree but still have it be this cool piece and not have to charge you five hundred dollars for it exactly. so I want to find some cool shapes and ways that I can cast sounds like a sprinkler <laughs> they're building something next door <laughs> ah. anyway so yeah if anyone wants to join me in the production class and learn from the production master on how you can make your system easier and how you can maybe like cast some of your designs to yeah. make let well, and less just, work for you. I, I really like to find ways for people to work smarter, not harder, yeah. you know, I mean, really, and be able to, I mean, I think a lot of people have um, this idea that production jewelry is like cheap thrown out jewelry. And there no. certainly is that in the world. But if you're trying to do that with your own stuff, and trying to make your own work and be in it and and have your you know part of you there and finding ways to distill your ideas down so that you can do a production line or even work in series mm -hmm. in a way that is connected and makes sense and and to stay inspired and make it ideas. so that you can do the thing that you really love right. and so you're not yes. like what i call stuck in the weeds you know like right. Nice. I don't want to create these big, cool triangle hoops and be sitting there filing my mitered corners all day long. Right. And thinking right. about right. if it's your business plan to always have everything made from scratch, great, cool, go ahead and do that. But yeah. to me, like creating a design and then creating a mold and then casting that design and then manipulating it and adding something to it that's still handmade. Like that is still, oh, yeah. that came from, you still did that. You Absolutely. know, it's Absolutely. not any yeah. like less or more. It's just, right. you know, like I don't have to charge you $500 because right. I didn't have to make so, it from scratch. And that's, and that's what I mean. It's like, you know, working smarter, not harder. You know, don't, don't think for a second that, you know, Carl Fabergé was sitting around a studio going, you know, today I think I'll make an egg and, and just trot over to the studio and whip one out. That's not what happened. I mean, he had like a crew of people that yeah. specialized in what they do yeah. and use those people for those skills to do what they do best to help him produce things in a beautiful, masterful way. And, mm -hmm. but, but it was a production, you know, it was producing these pieces that were elegant, one of a kind things, but also cigarette cases and, and smaller pieces that were Amazing the production stuff. line, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, it's really kind of fascinating when you like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anyway. I would love to have some like big hoops, you know, that yeah. like a lot of the structure of it is cast and then I can just add some filigree to it. I'd love to be able to do that. I think that would be fantastic. So that's why I'm we'll in your class. I hope other people will join me. I know that it's a, like a lot of a conversation and not just us sitting and listening okay. to you. I think that it's more of like a like a cohort, like actually working it together is. on figuring out designs, it really is. Well, knowing where got, to put screws, use... knowing how to design oh, yeah. it so that it casts. Yeah. Well, and we're doing not just the technical stuff, but some of the um, uh, business part. And there's also an element of, um, you know, designing for production. So, you know, working in that way that we're yeah. working smarter, not harder and working about out, talking about outsourcing. Um, and we also use uh, Padlet so that everybody in the class can has a um, uh, internet accessible place where they can post things and make notes and see what each other are doing and add tips and tricks and talk about the books that they want. So they, there's a room for everybody to just load stuff up, right? And okay. get, to get feedback and to get That's information ideas, to share information. So yeah, it works really well. Um, like I said, I think it's probably one of the my favorite classes that I've taught in the last 10 years. And do I have, do I have to have casting experience for, oh, do you have to have casting experience for production? I don't have no. hardly any casting None. experience beyond nope. 
making something and sending it to someone and having them make a mold and then having them cast it for me. I, I, I don't yeah. have any, I didn't even put yeah, the screws I, on that, which now I probably yeah, would because I didn't like how they did it. <laughs> I've been I've been a production caster for years and I'm a production bench jeweler and um yeah. and I know the things that I would have I would job out and the things that I don't and mm -hmm. I'll share that information as well and no you don't have to have casting experience to be able to do production it has nothing right. to do with that you know if you don't know how to do something if you were managing a business right you hire people that fill the gaps That's their that you specialty. Need. You, you hire yeah. people that, that have a specialty that, um, get, that can do things that you can't do. And it's like, get those people in and that's going to make your business stronger. Right. Yeah. So, you know, if you're managing, I would any, also any say business, like, you know, like for me, I don't make my own wire. I don't want to make right. my own wire because my time, I have kids, I have three kids, eight, six, and four. And so if I have an hour, I don't want to spend that hour trying to pull wire. Like, that's just not what I want to do. I want to make filigree. Yes. I mean, yeah. I want to do the swirling stuff. Thing. I want to do it what well, I love I, because I, I only have this to be, much time. Exactly. Exactly. You know, if you, if you want to do the thing you love and, you know, and you start doing stuff that's like the painstaking stuff that you hate, it's just going to yeah. suck your soul out. I don't have interns. <laughs> so, awful. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Every well, filigree do, house, house <laughs> like around the world, like the experts, you know, the master filigree makers, they all have a million interns. They're, they're just True. like, hey, go make me a whole bunch of filigree wire. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't have any right. of those. My interns yeah. just want Start to play on my chair and like <laughs> play with my rolling mill. Well, for, and... for right now, they do, but give them a year or two. <laughs> I mean, like, mm hmm. They're going to do go. their own thing. They, they, if I try to tell them what to do and give them like specific things, mm -mm. they'll be like, sorry, artistic. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want. Yeah. No. Okay. This is for the moon pie. I need you to twist that wire <laughs> for the yogurt cup. This is what you need to do today. And my four-year-old is like spinning in my chair. Whee! <laughs> oh my god just uh, yeah have one of them attach some wire and spin the four-year-old <laughs> they, would, they would love to do that but it would be oh mayhem god. yep oh my god all right well all right. i will talk to you later you okay. have a great evening we look Thank forward you. to your uh filigree classes and um uh yeah then there's granulation coming up there's rolling mill coming up there's all kinds of great stuff um chris is going to be doing in uh in in april we've got uh it's, it's earth month so we're going to be doing a recycling class we're going to be doing a um, renew, refurbish, re reface hammers with Chris from Lion Punch Force. Awesome. So we've got a whole bunch of fun stuff coming up. So, but I'm looking forward to it and I will see you again soon. Thank you okay. for sharing some of your favorite tools with yep. us tonight. Anytime. And, uh, I will talk about tools all, right. all day long. Yay. Okay. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye. See you Bye. later.